دكتور أحمد ساعة عشرة صارت يلا هلا بنبلش دكتور عباس جاهز؟ جاهز إن شاء الله طيب uh, Good evening everyone Hope you are uh, safe at your homes We are so pleased tonight We are so happy that we are hosting one of the uh, major names in the Arab world and in the world in the orthodontic uh, world Professor Dr. Abbas Zahir from Egypt it's an honor for us to host him. Uh, professor Abbas, uh, he's uh, a professor in, at uh, Alexandria University at the Department of Orthodontics. He's the president of the Egyptian Orthodontic Society. He's the past vice president of the World Orthodontic uh, Federation and the founding member of the Arab Orthodontic Society. He's a member of many and honorary member of many uh, orthodontic societies like Mexican, Greek, and Azerbaijanian orthodontic society. Professor Abbas is uh, a writer and an author of many, many articles. We, are, we have the pleasure and we are so um, pleased to host him. Thank you very much, Dr. Abbas. You are so welcome. And we, have, we hope that we might, uh, we can, host you face to face here in Palestine, Jerusalem. I hope so. That will be in a very near future. You are most welcome. The stage is yours, Dr. Abbas. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Rahal, for the organization of this event. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saad and Nafa for invitation. And actually, the pleasure is mine because uh, I've been wanting to meet uh, everybody in Palestine. Uh, for so many years, but I didn't have the chance to come and visit you in your country, which I hope will uh, soon uh, be uh, possible after this corona pand uh, pandemic, uh, hopefully finish safely. And uh, I would like to thank you all for this invitation. It's an honor for me and a pleasure to be with you tonight. I chose the, today to talk about orthodontics as a part, the orthodontist as a part of the team that uh, provide dental service to the patient. We are orthodontists, we are basically dentists with a further treatment to become an orthodontist, further, uh, sorry, education to become an orthodontist. And we are part of this team. So we should not assume that everything can be solved using orthodontic techniques. We should uh, consult with our colleagues. We should refer to our colleagues for uh, their uh, help and uh, work all the cases for the benefit of the patient, giving the, the patient the best possible uh, uh, treatment he can have. After all, most of the patient that comes to uh, dental treatment, whether having pain, whether having uh, needing restoration, whatever treatment you do, they need also aesthetics. So th there is no way you can provide them with uh, treatment that does not 
take care of their aesthetics. So consequently, orthodontist is part of this team and is concerned mainly with aesthetics. Of course, function, stability, health of the tissues are important, but aesthetics is of prime importance for the patient. And when I say we work together in a team, I say like we work, I said, multidisciplinary, not multi, uh, interdisciplinary, not multidisciplinary. And I wanted to say, what are the differences between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary? I look at the Webster dictionary and I looked at multidisciplinary treatment and it was uh, defined as a group of healthcare workers who, who are member of different disciplines independently treat various issues of the patient may have, focusing on the issue to which they specialize. Uh, I'm trying to minimize the, the camera so that the, the whole, uh, anyway. So if we focus on this, uh, definition, it says they work independently. So each one will do his work and then they collectively produce uh, service to the patient. Whereas interdisciplinary, the same a group of healthcare professionals from diverse fields, but work in a coordinated fashion, meaning they work together from the start they consult together and they provide the treatment to the patient in turn. And they, they consult together several times during the course of treatment. So since we said, and we agree that we are concerned with aesthetics and let me, let me uh, show you or uh, agree upon the characteristics of aesthetic smile which is the, the aesthetic zone of the patient. So we would like to have the gingival margin level of the two centrals at the same level, slightly higher than that of the lateral incisors. And then the gingival level of the canine, again, higher at the same level of the central incisor. So we need to uh, concentrate to have this high, low, high uh, relationship of the gingival margin, very important for the aesthetic reads. The incisal edges of the two centrals usually are slightly longer than the lateral incisor and slightly at the same level or slightly uh, longer than that of the canine to form a curve of smile. The curve of smile is usually we want to have it a consonant curve of smile that is conforming with the lower lip upon smiling. So this curve of smile should conform to this curve made by the lower lip upon smile. Then we have incisal embrasure, a very small triangular embrasure between the two centrals, slightly larger between the center and lateral due to the contouring of the incisal uh, edge and the corner of the lateral incisor, and then much larger between the uh, lateral and the canine. Again, very important aspect is the contact between the teeth. We would like to have a contact that is not a point contact. It should be an area contact and should form in between the two centers, should form like 50% of the contact between the two centers should be made out of enamel contact. This area contact decreases as we go back. So between the central and lateral should be about, about 40% of the contact. And then between the uh, lateral and canine, about 30%. Again, the scallop line of the gingival contour should be symmetric, slightly Di uh, diversion distally, the peak of the contour, and conforming with the exit, normal exit inclination of the inside. Most important thing is to be 
symmetric on both sides and slightly distal inclination of the central and lateral. And then the canine should be upright. Again, the contact between the two centrals, we said contact area rather than contact point, and it should be at the, constitute the middle and the incisal third of the two of the contact. Small incisal uh, embrasure and gingival embrasure completely filled with a healthy papel. We do not like to see space uh, in this uh, gingival embrasure, which is sometimes due to lack of the, of the healthy papilla. And this will form like a small black triangle that is very obvious in the eyes of the patient and whoever looked, and it's very unesthetic. Of course, there are ways to take care of this black triangle if it happens. Beside gingival surgery, there are ways by moving the axial inclination of the teeth or the contact point, we can influence this uh, embryo. So interdisciplinary treatment, that's what we do. Once we start the treatment, we have to remember that uh, not every case should be solved with orthodontic techniques. We have to learn that we, we need to uh, consult with other partner in the dental team and uh, seek their expertise and let them do what they do best and we do our part as orthodontists. So it's very important to communicate together with the other team and cooperate uh, the treatment plan. What does the, the team member requires from you? So the other operator, what does he want from you? The operator wants from you to give, to facilitate his work. That's it. Make my work easier so I can produce the best result I can. Give me accessibility to, uh, to the teeth to work, to do my work better and to let me deliver the best treatment outcome I can, I can produce. On the other hand, the patient, what does he need? Why does he want to need to go from one office to the other? The patient wants to the best aesthetic result, of course. He doesn't want to make a complicated treatment on the easiest treatment. And he wants the cheapest or the least price to pay. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a few of the aspects that orthodontists can contribute in the dental aesthetic to give the aesthetic of the patient the best. And I'm going to talk about preparation for restorative work. And I'm going to emphasize on orthodontic finishing with taking into consideration patient aesthetics, meaning some few tricks that can improve aesthetics, make you deliver the best treatment result you can. So if you take these pictures of, uh, if I want to say, very strange buildings, me as a lay person, I would say that buildings are usually built by engineers. So at the same time, the patient, when they see this kind of uh, appliances, braces, elastics, and so on, see, he, he always think that this is orthodontic treatment. And who does orthodontic treatment? He believes that dentist or orthodontist will do orthodontic treatment. So not every case that have braces and this sort of elastics are, is, can, you, can be called orthodontics. This one too. These patients has been under treatment, like a, a faulty treatment 
the first one for six years before she realized that she's not getting better. The second one after two years and a half, luckily enough, he found, he can, came to the conclusion that uh, his teeth actually look worse than when he started. So this kind of poor orthodontic treatment, if you think about it, is usually due to a faulty diagnosis or wrong treatment planning. If you plan something, if you don't know the cause, you will not uh, treat the case right. And then poor execution, like the one who's not using wires at all or uh, using the wrong wires. And in most of the cases, it is usually due to all of the above. And in such cases, disasters can come, can happen. Like this case that I found on the internet, uh, I assume that uh, they had the like reverse curve of speed left for a long time and the case developed like this. So this can lead to disasters. So let's talk first about our role as part of the team for the preparation for further restorative work. I'm gonna give you an example, but first let me talk about how we plan and how we work interdisciplinary cases, what is the best way to do it. So if before working in interdisciplinary cases, several steps has to be taken. First, we have to diagnose the case well and identify what does this patient needs to get the best aesthetic result he or she can have. Then we consult with other specialists. If he needs surgery, we consult with the surgeon, perio, we consult with the periodontist, restorations, we consult with the restorative dentist and so on, implant and so on. After we gather all this information and decide what that the patient needs, we design a comprehensive treatment plan together with all the group, the team, I will call them the team. After we design a comprehensive treatment plan and we agree that this is the best for the patient, we have to discuss all details with the patient, including time, including uh, expenses, and the expected results. Once the patient understands exactly and consent to this treatment plan, then we stage the treatment plan, like who start first, and then which branch will take over, and then who will finish, and so on. So we plan step-by-step -step, uh, treatment for this patient. So if you follow these rules, you will definitely arrive to the best uh, result the patient can have. Let me show you an example of a multidisciplinary treatment plan. This was a patient of mine. He came to my office, of course, uh, the complaining of the unesthetic smile. He had uh, a gigantic central incisor germinated with an extra tooth and a space between, uh, of the other central incisor. Let me look, I'll show you closely what did the patient look like. Intraorally, he had uh, a germinated central incisor with an extra lateral incisor and another one impacted on the right side. He had a class three relationship, open bite, anterior open bite, and crowding. So not only the case was complicated with the presence of the gemination, but also with a difficult malocclusion to treat, class three open bite, crowding, and so on. So I look at this patient, I decided that I am that is an orthodontic uh, case. And I plan the treatment as follow. First of all, 
I look at this central incisor and there is no way you can reduce the size of the central incisor because the neck of the tooth itself is large, one pulp chamber and a very huge uh, root canal, a root. So impossible to reduce the size of this tooth in an aesthetic manner. From the X-ray, I look at the X-ray, try to understand more. So these are the canine first molar, uh, first premolar, second premolar, and molar. Uh, there is no problem with them. The main problem lie in the four front teeth, as you can see here. So on the right side, there was a lateral incisor that is erupted already, slightly palatal, but erupted. The other lateral incisor on the left side was situated palatal with no space at all to move to the labial. The first geminated tooth, which is the left central incisor, is the one you see in the patient's mouth. And the second with the right geminated central incisor is impacted here in its place, but impacted with no space to erupt. Severe crowding and uh, impacted tooth with two extra large uh, central incisors that are really disfiguring. So first of all, I decided to extract the central incisor, left central incisor, and the lower central incisor. When I extract for the lower, it will serve me for two things. First, give me space to align the teeth without proclination, further proclination. It will help in the deepening of the bite, and it will create a Bolton discrepancy in the lower arch uh, with maxillary uh, excess. Then in the extraction in the upper arch, I will get rid of one tooth, one large tooth, align the two laterals in place, allow the other central incisor, the geminated central incisor to erupt, and then fabricate a crown with, that looks like two, central, two smaller central incisors in its place. And this plan seems very logic to me, since I am also a dentist, but I don't have the experience of every, in every branch. But this plan seemed quite interesting and quite reasonable. So for the lower, we took this lower central, we closed the space, aligned the teeth, let the bite deepen a little bit. And in the upper, we moved we moved the lateral in, the, in its place and allow some space to erupt the, the right central incisor. Of course, when we extract the upper central tooth, I don't want the patient to walk around without any teeth in his front, his mouth. So I fabricated this uh, fixed, a prosthesis and made a tooth central incisor in the right side so that when we extract the central, the left central, we have space to uh, align uh, lateral incisor and we use this tooth as anchorage for the alignment of the other teeth. So we place the central, the, the artificial central incisor on an enhanced appliance fixed using a transpalatal arch, send the patient to extract the central, the left, right, left central incisor, and then start aligning the remaining teeth using this artificial tooth for anchoring the device. If you can see here that this bracket is reversed, this one is reversed too, because we need to, uh, a lot of reverse root torque like labial root torque of the center of the lateral incisors because they were situated far in the palate and we want them upright. Once we put a rectangular arch wire in the slot, 
uh, automatically will have a reverse torque effect on these two T's. After alignment, this is a round wire. And then once we put a rectangular wire, we start inducing reverse torque to bring the root labial here and here. As you can see, we did not start anything in the lower arch. After alignment, we removed the artificial tooth, exposed the right central incisor, placed an attachment. As you can see, with an, the bracket and with an attachment, and then anchor on a base arch wire, stainless steel arch wire, rectangular, to produce more root torque on the center, on the lateral inside, and with an auxiliary arch wire attached to the tooth, we start moving the tooth occlusally. The doctor, the rest, the surgeon closed the flap and we watched the tooth erupt in its position, as you can see. We already extracted in the lower arch and the space is closed. Now I start pulling the tooth down and using triangular elastic to maximize or to increase the anchorage, the effect of uh, upward effect on the other teeth until the tooth is fully erupted, overbite uh, achieved, spaces are closed, and now I decide to move this tooth in the middle of the space and then send it to the restorative dentist to fabricate this crown that looks like two central incisors. At this time, everything is aligned. We have uh, good relationships. As you can see, okay, you can see here that the torque of the two central in lateral incisors are okay, and you can know that from the cingulum level here. If the cingulum was very pronounced, that would mean that the root is still in the palate, the lower inc lower central lower incisors are well aligned too. And the x-rays, the x rays the panoramic x-ray show good root parallelism. And I assumed in my mind that I did this patient very good work. I sent him to one of the good restorative dentists, asking him to realize my idea of fabricating a crown on this tooth that looks like two teeth with, that would fill the space. In my mind, I wanted something that looks like this, two teeth built up on this single tooth. And it made sense to me. Now the problem is the first restorative dentist didn't, didn't want to uh, do the case, was not excited about it as I was and told the patient that it will not look nice at all and it's too very difficult to fabricate. And uh, anyway, in brief, it made me look uh, bad in the eyes of the patient because I, as if I am planning something that's not feasible and nobody can treat. He went to another one, he said the same thing. So apparently, because the constricted or the limited uh, play space in the neck, the neck area is key because they have to finish the crown around the neck. I didn't think of that. The only way they can do crowns is to do like two crowns that are conversion and that emerges from this neck of the tooth. In addition, they had the problem of making an, uh, an embrasure, gingival embrasure between these two teeth. And aesthetically, they believe it will not look at all nice. So finally, another dentist uh, agree with me that this is the only solution and he want, was willing to help the patient and fabricated this crown for the patient. Of course, I would, love, I would have loved to have these two teeth longer, 
but there are limitations to what he can do because this is the neck of the tooth emerging from here to here. And he had to make a little bit of gingiva so he can make an embrasure. Anyway, that was his best. And the patient was very happy. He has two teeth now. Actually, it looks very nice. He doesn't have a very high lip line, but uh, Regardless that, that this, is, was, this was the only possible solution, but I should have consulted with the restorative dentist first before implementing any of my treatment so that when I send the patient, the patient knows exactly what will happen. The doctor is expecting the situation when he, and he, has, he had planned how to correct the case. So I can say, this is an example of a multidisciplinary treatment plan. I did my part of treatment. The restorative dentist did his part, but we did not, we did not coordinate well ahead the treatment plan, and we did not um, uh, explain it well to the patient so he knows what to expect at the end of treatment. So I show you this case, although I am happy with the result, I don't know how other way I could have done it, but the situation was not nice having the patient to go to a doctor and then the doctor tell him, no, I don't, I cannot do a good job. It didn't look nice. I'm gonna show you another case of an interdisciplinary treatment. Interdisciplinary treatment. This case came to me, didn't like her smile. She had a super eruption of some teeth, like this one and this one, exit inclination, uh, not well. The teeth super erupted and then became atri uh, had attrition. So they look, incisal edge look uh, aligned, but the crowns, one smaller than the other. You can see the roots have moved uh, more incisal. And then in addition, the canines have different rotation. So this canine look smaller than this one because of the rotation. And then in addition to that, the crowding is low. Okay. Again, the, the crown length is different. Gingival margins are not aligned at all. We don't have this high, low, high. We have high, low, 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 high, high. <laughs> so, uh, when we place the bracket, first of all, I planned with the restorative dentist that she will, I will align the teeth, I will correct the axial inclination, I will level the gingival margins, and then she will receive crowns on the four incisor teeth because they had defective crown. So we agreed with that with the, with the restorative dentist. We communicated with her, and she was expecting this to happen at the end of treatment. So how do you work this case? I first place the bracket according to the gingival margin level, not according to the incisor edges, because the incisor edge had attrition, a lot of attrition here and here. And we need to uh, align them so that the gingival margin level have the high, low, high that we want. So at the straight wire, the teeth have been aligned more or less. We needed some more refinement. So we made some bends in the wire to uh, refine the exit inclination. Then they needed some more intrusion of the four incisor so that the gingival margin be uh, at the level with the canines. So we made another wire uh, adjustment and we intruded the four incisors. After intrusion, the, the, cases, the case looked like this. So she had open bite, she has unleveled incisal edges, but she has gingival margin level that is well aligned, high, low, high. And when I finished the case like this, the patient was not astonished because she had an idea that she will finish in an open white. She will have to have the crowns on the teeth. So she knew that from the start, and the doctor knew that. So when I sent the patient to the doctor, 
he was very happy to do her crowns because he didn't have to neither do gingivectomy nor do a crown lengthening or anything. And he did his work and it was good uh, for crowns. From my part, I did the gingival margin levels and the alignment of the axle uh, inclination, as well as the labeling. So the smile of the patient before and after, big improvement because we respected each other speciality. He does crowns much better than I can do. I haven't done any, I haven't done any crowns in 30 years. And I did well preparing the case for his services. So that was how it, she started. Look at the gingival margin level, very poor. And after I finished the case ready for uh, restorations, I had aligned first the gingival margin, the exit inclination, the alignment, and then I sent the patient for restoration. So this is how you, you provide your patient with the best aesthetics you can uh, provide him with. Another example. This patient came with very ugly smile, as you can see. Intraoral, he had attrition on teeth. Crown lengths are uh, and gingival margin level are not aligned. The crown lengths are not equal, as you can see. In addition, he had a midline deviation. You have to look at this. A midline deviation to the left. So in combination with everything else, we have to deal with all of this. If you look at the crown size of the central and compare it to that of the lateral, you will have a ratio of like four to five. Like the lateral is four fifths of the center. Whereas normally we would like to have the lateral three quarter, uh, two thirds of the center. So we need larger central incisor or smaller lateral. And if you look at the patient, he's a male, big, uh, big in size. You can see that the central incisor are too small for his smile. And we have some spaces too. So it was decided that we will increase the size of the central incisor. And we did kind of changeable, uh, like smile design. So we want to increase the size of each center incisor by one and a half millimeter. And at the meantime, use the, the space mesial to the left central because the midline is deviated to the right and use the space distal to the right central because in order to achieve a good size center incisor. So we will increase the size of the central incisors at the same time, move the central line to the right, one, one and a half millimeter. And then the lateral incisors and canine will follow. The sizes are okay, but need some adjustment of the alignment. So we will give the size of the central, give it the three, three to four, which is like the width uh, three quarter of the length, and then the lateral two thirds of the size of width of the central, and what is shown from the canine two thirds the width of the lateral. So this is the design, the smile design we did, and I start executing the pitch again. When I place the bracket, I place them according to the gingival margin level that we need to achieve at the end of the treatment. So the braces were places accordingly. Straight wire align this, uh, align the gingival margin. And we left some spaces for the increasing size of the central incisor. And then the patient went 
to the restorative dentist, no, dentist knowing that he will receive six crowns on the front teeth, two larger central incisor, lateral the same size and uh, canine. And if we try to superimpose what we have planned in the beginning, it matches more or less uh, exactly. So this is again interdisciplinary treatment plan because the steps, I identified the problem. I communicated with another specialist who can do crowns. I communicated the treatment, we did the treatment plan and communicated with the patient and got the patient consent to it. Patient knew about the cost and the time involved and how it will look like. And then I finished the case that doesn't look nice knowing that he will have to continue the treatment with uh, more work with the restorative dentist. And then finally, the patient had his restorations uh, done. Uh, I just want to tell you that it's not that I carry on the treatment until the end and then I send the patient. No, I send the patient several times during treatment for the doctor to check the spaces. He would ask me to move the center to the left uh, half a millimeter or to the right half a millimeter, elongate, extrude, intrude, whatever he wants we can do with braces. So we don't wait until the end, but we do uh, cooperate and com communicate several times during the course of treatment. Okay, when would we like to do the restorative work? In my opinion, for me, if we can do the restorative work before the treatment or another or any kind of restoration before the treatment, it will help me. It will help me because it gives me the, the true shape and size of the crown. So I just close the spaces around this crown and I don't have to estimate the remaining amount of uh, space around the crown uh, before sending and before demanding. So if I have the tooth restored to the normal crown size, I just close the spaces. It gives me a realistic representation of the tooth angulation because the crown, if made according to the true root angulation, I can just adjust the crown and automatically will adjust the root. And also for the patient, he will enjoy aesthetics or good aesthetics during the course of treatment. He would not have to wait with a small tooth or a defective tooth until the end of treatment to fix it. There are all, of course, disadvantages, such as sometimes it's the space or the accessibility to uh, restore a tooth are not possible and they will hinder any good uh, restoration. A lot of time, or most of the time, the restoration that have been done before treatment are temporary and will need to be redone or repeated after treatment with good material or in a better way. So there is an additional cost and time for the patient. So you have to weigh the advantage and disadvantage in each individual case and uh, accordingly plan your treatment. So the restorative interference have to be done either before, during, or after treatment. There is no other solution. Let me give you examples of cases that can be done before, cases that have to be done during, and cases that can wait until after treatment. So this case of a peg-shaped lateral insider, the other side have a missing lateral. Of course, this peg-shaped lateral incisor is not uh, aesthetic. I can work with the patient and uh, adjust the spaces around it and then when the doctor uh, agree I can debond and he can do the restoration. But I thought that the patient can have a cheap uh, restoration that resembles exactly the shape of the crown and the angulation of the root and I will then place my brackets over it, align the teeth and at the end the doctor of the restorative dentist will be able to exchange it with a more durable type of restoration like uh, laminates or veneer or crowns. So in this case, when you look at the x-ray, you see there is an angulation of the root with a different angulation on the crown. So what we want to do is to have 
the root angulation corrected so that the final restoration be on the parallel, uh, the root is parallel to the neighboring piece. So I sent the, the, the patient to the doctor. He did the restoration, exact shape and size of the lateral incisor on the right uh, 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 root angulation. So that when I place my brackets, I have already, I will be able already to visualize my root angulation, visualize exactly the size and shape of the tooth, and I can finish it well like this, so that the patient can have new crown with the other side implant, the same size, exactly the size that the doctor required, so there are no uh, guessing guesswork. And this is the end of treatment. He was ready for implant and another uh, permanent restoration of the lateral incisor. There are, of course, limitations to starting first, as we said, and these are mainly spaces and accessibility to the tooth to be repaired. And uh, you have to think about this when you plan your treatment. During orthodontic treatment, and that most of the cases can be done this way if we need to, like this patient had two small lateral incisors that we decided to increase its size to restore the golden proportion between the central and lateral incisors. So after alignment, I open up space distal to the lateral incisors, as you can see. Then I remove the brackets and send it to the restorative dentist to uh, do his restoration according according to the golden proportion, which is like lateral incisor, two third center incisor in width and contour the distal surface, have a lot of space, he can contour and finish the distal surface of the lateral. Well, the doctor did his work, he had good size, restoration well finished in the distal surface. I place back my brackets, close the remaining spaces and finish the case. So if you look at the case, these are the two small lateral, we know that the lateral incisor, the medial surface of the normal lateral incisor is usually have right angle, the medial uh, uh, proximal uh, inclusive angle. And in the distal surface is usually contoured angle. So that's, that's why I had the tooth placed just adjacent to the central incisor, very not in the middle of the space as required by, uh, requested by the prosthodontist, but medial and leave the, all the space to be restored in the distal. That's how it changed. So it's good before you depend and decide to send the case to the restorative dentist to ask him, is this the good position? Is this a good size or it gives out space? What do you need more and so on? Another example, Two small laterals again, but there is crowding that cannot, it's not possible to uh, do any restoration until we have enough space. And also there is the broken uh, corner here that will not allow me to uh, easily adjust the contact air. So after extraction and alignment and spacing, I remove the brackets, send the patient for restoration, the doctor did his restoration, and then I put back my braces and finish the case. Of course, having the teeth restored before the end of treatment, like here and here, allow me to close all the spaces and finish the, two, the case well. This one case also had a broken uh, corner. It's impossible or difficult to uh, achieve a good contact. So after I open up space, I align them as much as I can. I send them for temporary restoration of the broken uh, uh, corner of the tooth. And then I finish my work. 
here too, broken point, broken uh, corner of the central and lateral. Open up spaces so that the doctor can restore and finish well, and then close the spaces and finish the case. So these are examples of these are examples of how to uh, prepare the tools for the teeth for restoration, and then uh, continue your orthodontic treatment afterward to finish the teeth. There are some contraindications to doing the restorative treatment during orthodontic treatment, meaning not waiting until you finish. When the restorations are not needed for good orthodontic finishing, if it does not help me, there is no point of having the patient pay more, uh, have more cost of expenses and do temporary restoration in the middle of treatment if, the, if, if, I'm, if I'm not going to be uh, needing that for finishing. Or if major dental work is projected after treatment, so there is no, not possible to do half of the work and then do another half after treatment. So to show you uh, some example of uh, restoration that are done after treatment, when we don't need it for orthodontic finishing, like this broken contact, we don't need to, to correct it before finishing because the contact is already established and we only need to uh, correct this uh, corner for aesthetic reason. So there was no uh, hurry for me to do it before treatment because I can fix the contact and the length of the tooth before treatment. And another example of when it's needed, when there is a major uh, restorative work to be done, and cannot be done in the middle of treatment. For example, this patient came because she didn't have, she had, sorry, uh, an ugly smile, as she said, with spacing, and these two crowns are uh, very large in size to decrease the amount of spacing, but still have spacing. So she had an extra large at a central incisor, in addition to this medium, big medium test. So if we do restoration, that's what she's complaining of. She's complaining of spacing and large teeth. So let's assume we want to do restoration, restorative first. We remove the crowns, we do smaller crowns, and then we do orthodontic treatment. What will happen? We'll have more spacing in the arch, which is uh, disfiguring for her, and she didn't want that. So uh, it's not uh, wise to do the restoration before orthodontic treatment. Now the width of the central incisor is about, you know, instead of the, two the lateral tooth to be two thirds, the lateral is two fifths of the center. And the proportions of length to width is almost one to one instead of three quarters. So there is no way we would reach the, just close the spaces. We have to decrease the size of the central incisor. So we did uh, planning. We want to intrude the teeth. We want to uh, close the spaces. We want to reduce the size of the crown of the central incisors. And we want the canine to be showing more because it's showing less than what's needed to be shown. So decrease the space, the, the width of the central. By I can one and a half millimeter of each tooth. So I started to close the spaces. At the same time, each time I close the space, I reduce the size of the crown, the restoration that has been on the tooth. So that when I finish, I have two central incisors, small in shape, ready to receive good sized crowns in order to give her the best step. We, could not, we did not do the lower arch because she didn't want to do extensive treatment. She just want to uh, align and close the spaces and finish with crowns in the upper. 
So after treatment, these are the reduced crowns here. This lateral, the canine was defective and the reduced crowns. And after uh, the, uh, crown reconstruction, the good size incisor, relatively good with the lateral and what is showing from the canine. So she had six restorations. You can see that we established good uh, proportion between the lateral and central and the good proportion for the incisor, for the central incisor. So we planned, right, we did a smile analysis, we did a smile design in conjunction with uh, the consultation with the restorative dentist. I executed my part and during the treatment, she has been followed up by her uh, restorative dentist until we agreed that she's ready for the crown and removal of the tooth. Of course, there is a big difference between the start and the treatment because we took into consideration what the patient wants and what she needs. Again, this case needs restoration, but it's a, a major work to be done after. There is no way we can do the work during or before treatment. She will need restoration of three missing teeth. So we start by expansion, with a cleft, of course. Open up space, uh, actually, two teeth, because here she's missing one lateral incisor, but the space could accommodate two teeth, and the center line you see it's deviated to the right. In these cases, we have to compromise your treatment. You just give her an arch shape and alignment, and then you cannot close this gap. She will have to place a restoration with a compromised final result in the central line deviation. Here, we had to compromise this. I don't want to talk about the oral hygiene. She was a bit negligent, but sometimes they are discouraged to take care of their teeth and they are, uh, uh, they are not motivated as well. So this result could not be, of course, uh, achieved before the end of treatment. Also here, major work to be done. Uh, crowns on the central incisors, the central and lateral incisor, Correct, correction of the crowding, correction of the bimaxillary protrusion, and correction of the anterior open bite. So we start aligning after extraction, close the bite, align the teeth. Never mind, this is the black triangle, never mind, because she will, have, she will receive crowns on the four incisors. So finish like this, and then the restoration improved the result 100%. So because we have a lot of work to do, there is no accessibility now. The teeth are crowded. Very difficult to make good crowns on teeth that are crowded, or exit finish is, is, uh, is uh, defective. So she would have to wait until the end of treatment and that's a good example of when we do restoration after the end of the completion of the orthodontic preparation for them. Again, interdisciplinary. The doctor knew that she will need uh, crowns. She knew <clears throat> and she, she expected this kind of result. So remember, work interdisciplinary and not multidisciplinary. Diagnose, consult, with the expert, discuss with the patient, and start your treatment. Consult first, then start your treatment. Early restorative, restorative, give you a better feel of the size and shape of the tooth. Patient must be aware that restoration done before and, and in the middle of, treat, of, 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 the, of the treatment might be uh, Rida. Uh, should I go uh, five more minutes? Yeah, of course, of course, Dr. Abbas. Okay. 
Uh, how long do you want me to finish? As you wish. Okay, I will go uh, for this section. I will finish this section, and then you tell me if I want me to continue or to stop. Okay. So another part that we can do easily is because I can see that many of my patients have attrition on the level of the incisal edges, even teenagers, like this case. You can do what I call touch up of the incisor, like enameloplasty, just remove a little bit of enamel, grind a little bit of enamel to improve or to enhance your result. Let me show you a few examples of uh, conservative enameloplasty. This patient finished, the teeth are well aligned, uh, but the incisor edges are not perfect because of the attrition. So I can see that if I grind this, I mark with a, with a black marker, the areas that I want to reduce. So I know the amount of enamel that I will remove and I can uh, remove them safely and improve the results. Let me show you the difference between before and after. And these are like two minutes procedures that can uh, improve the result uh, many times more. When we do this uh, grinding of the incisor edge, we have to be careful not to uh, destroy the proportions of the teeth. So we have to keep the gingival margin level of the side inside, uh, central incisor higher than the lateral and uh, the same level of the canine. So this is very important. Do not uh, rush to extrude, for example, this tooth in order to make it longer here, but the, uh, you know, destroy this relationship, which is more important and more difficult to achieve. And then when we affect the grinding, make sure that you do not shorten the piece, the central incisor to make it as long as the latch. So it has to be longer. So we know that we're gonna remove this to make it a little bit here and a little bit here to make it even. So we remove a little bit at the same time, we did not destroy the proportion of the piece. The teeth have been uh, improving in the shape, the smile has improved, and the teeth, uh, very minor amount of uh, reduction. Another time, another uh, way we can improve by uh, enameloplasty is the rounding of the angles. If you look at these two, two uh, shapes, the shape of the, with the rounded uh, angles looks smaller than the one with the uh, right angles. However, they are both exactly the same. And we apply this to the teeth. For example, this patient after treatment, after several months of treatment, she came back with the complaint that her two center incisors are showing too much as, uh, and they are uh, moving forward. So I told her, no, they are well aligned, maybe the angles are uh, a little bit sharp here. So I can do some rounding of the angle and it look much better. So exactly that's what we did. We mark again with the black marker, the areas that we want to reduce. And then we round them up. And then the patient was very happy thinking that uh, the size of the teeth are now smaller, doesn't show as much as this. And with like a two, two minutes procedure, Roundation of the corner and it will improve much the results. Also, this was planned beforehand. You can see that the, the corner of the lateral incisor is very right angle here and here. And I planned that after treatment, I'll make roundation. I told the patient. So after treatment, we did this small roundation and it improved the shape, size, the looks of the case much, much better than before. So this is immediately after, treat, after treatment, this is after contouring of the corners. So don't be shy to uh, improve the final result with some touch up for the, to the enamel. I'm gonna show you very few examples of how the enameloplasty can improve your final results. So the top pictures, these are the start of the case crowding, overlapping, attrition, end of uh, treatment, alignment, well, exit inclination are good, 
project over white, but still the alignment of the incisal edges are not very good because of the attrition that are present. So after I did some grinding of the incisal edges, the case has improved like 50% from here to here. Let me show you how much I did. You know, I removed this tip here and here, a little bit here and here. Just small amount of grind. Another case, you see the exit inclination of the piece are not good and they are measly conversion, the root, but the incisor edges are aligned. So I have to tell the patient that once you align the teeth, the incisal edges will not be aligned. You can see here there is the, it's showing now the incisal edge malalignment because the exit inclination is correct. So after a small amount of grinding, you improve the shape of the smile of the case by another 50%. Again, we did not remove too much of the enamel. You can see here, just flatten the incisal edge, remove the, the area here to make it flat, foundation here. Very minor amount of crowd. This case, we did a little bit more of, uh, uh, of grinding because there was a lot of attrition, the shape of the seed, the knees are defective. So that's after alignment. You can see an equal length of the teeth. We concentrated on alignment of the incisal edges of the gingival margin, I'm sorry. And then we would like to touch up the incisal edges. And that's after alignment, after alignment and uh, incisal uh, enamelloplasty. And that's the amount of the enamel that I've taken out here, the corner, and then the foundation here. So, uh, don't be shy to uh, touch up the enamel to improve your final results. And these are the burrs I use. Mainly this one is to flatten the incisal edge. And once you shorten the incisal edge, you go up into a wider uh, area of the enamel uh, labiolingual because the tooth is conical in shape and it goes to the wider area and you have to decrease from the palatal surface of the tooth in order to have a thin uniform incisal edge. So we use this bird to reduce from the palatal surface. This smaller one I use to round the corners. This one is a finishing bird to smooth the, the corners and the embrasures. And this one is to smooth the in, uh, incisal edges. And finally, polishing and smoothing with soft legs this. And very small armamentarium, but it induced a very uh, good uh, improvement of the final result. I will stop here and thank you very much for your invitation. I really enjoyed being with you. Looking forward to be with you uh, in person. Inshallah, thank, thank you very much for this nice presentation, Dr. Abbas. It was really nice and uh, very nice tips also for uh, nice finishing. Uh, if you don't mind, we, we have, uh, until now we have only one question. Yeah. You can um, reply. Would you please share your ideas on how to convince the patient about the restorative part as most of them are not convinced due to financial reasons? And the second question is, could you please tell us type of brackets that you use? Thank you. Uh, okay, how do I get out of this uh, share screen mode? Stop share? Okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, first of all, I use uh, regular brackets. I'm using American orthodontic brackets. I have my special uh, prescription that I have developed over uh, several years of experience. So I started with high torque, for example, in the incisors. Then I went back to low, to low torque, like I am using uh, uh, 14 degrees on the centers and uh, 11 degrees on the laterals. I am using uh, a bi-dimensional technique, uh, 
uh, 18 uh, on the upper incisor uh, brackets and then 22 in the other teeth. I'm using a Lewis bracket in the lower premolar to reduce the contact, the, the interference, possible interference. And uh, uh, this is basically, uh, any appliance can do what I'm doing. I'm just talking about concepts. Uh, what was the first part of the question? Uh, the first part is how you, do you convince your patients about the um, uh, restorative parts of the treatment because they don't usually they don't accept it due to financial reasons. <laughs> but they have to actually the, the patient right is to know exactly how much it will cost him or her before we start the treatment because there is no point of doing some treatment and then the patient cannot continue and do a restoration. So if he's not going to be willing to do a restoration you have to uh, think about another compromise. And I believe that all our uh, treatment is a compromise treatment at the end. I see. Somehow. Uh, well, many people are thanking you for the nice and really informative uh, presentation. Uh, but Dr. Zainab al Din, she's asking uh, about the first case. If the patient did not complain about the central size, would you have extracted the pores and did some IPR instead of going through through the restorative procedures? Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Zenet, that's a very good question. That's I showed this case because I I, I don't consider it the I, I I consider myself did a mistake with this case. I uh, I learned from this case to consult with the specialist because I didn't have any idea how difficult it is to, to construct uh, two crowns on, uh, on, on a single tooth. And uh, I don't know, I, I should have consulted the endodontist and the restorative uh, expert to tell me if there is any way they can reduce the size of the central incisor and give him a good uh, size piece acceptable. I rushed into treatment actually. And, uh, but I believe that the patient was coming mainly complaining of this large tooth. He did not complain about the impacted or the missing tooth that doesn't show. He was complaining mainly about having a very large tooth. It was obvious. And it was, uh, we can do, of course, if we can small, make the crown smaller somehow with another expert, we, can, we could have extracted premolars and reduced uh, the the protrusion and the crowding and align everything. But I'm showing this case to tell you not to do the same like I did. I want you to consult first with the specialists, all of them, and then start your treatment. Don't take matters in your hands and try to solve everything without consulting with others. Okay, another question uh, for Dr. Abbas. Is there any tips for bracket bonding? And do you believe on putting the canine and lateral brackets on the same level or rather putting the canine more gingival, seeking canine guidance? Uh, no, I like to put the canine more gingival than the laterals, but I like to make sure that I will finish with a consonant curve of smile, like uh, the centrals are showing, uh, giving the, 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 the curve consonant meaning like the center are longer than the canine, at least on smiling. It will not uh, compromise the canine guidance and uh, it will uh, give a better smile. Uh, tips for uh, bonding. I do bonding, for example, for the canine because I want the canine to be rotated uh, mesiobuccally a little bit. I want the canine slightly uh, off center, mesial to the center. Because if you uh, want the canine to show more, you bond it slightly off center distal. It will rotate the canine and show more of its surface. If you want the canine to show less, you bond it uh, off center mesially. And uh, the canine is a very crucial tool for the aesthetics. If you change the torque, if you change the rotation, if you change the, the length, it will make a big difference. Symmetry depends actually on the canines 
and then every, everything else will follow in good uh, shape. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, in fact, that was the last question, but many people like for us, Dr. Faras Alayan, Dr. Yasmin Mahmoud, Dr. Hala, Dr. Shakir Al Makalih, Dr. Rafa, Dr. Sayer Hamid, they are all thanking you for this nice and informative uh, lecture. I think we've got another question from uh, Dr. George Dehabra. He's yeah. asking, uh, we are happy to see you tonight in the uh, germination case, the tooth crossed the midline. Can you tell us about the palatal uh, suture and the root resorption in this particular case? I would like to say hello to George first, and then <laughs> I will tell him that it's proven now that you can cross the midline without problem using the right amount of forces. And uh, it didn't have, we didn't have any problem with this case, moving it to the midline. The problem with the case, like uh, Dr. Zainab said, which is a very good question. The problem is that I rushed into treatment without proper consultation. And I, this is the message I want to tell you about by showing this case. Don't rush, consult first. Maybe it's a good uh, plan, or maybe you, there was another way to treat the case. So uh, what about the root resorption? Was there any root resorption? For that case, I didn't see any root resorption, any you know, noticeable uh, root resorption action. Okay, there might be a microscopic root resorption, like all other cases, but uh, uh, on the X-ray, there was no re noticeable resorption. Okay, Dr. Khaled Abul Azim is saying, super informative lecture from my mentor.